Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to join our good friend and host, Dr. Watson, as he waits for us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Well, are you all set for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, my boy, I'm all set, as you put it. I was looking over my notes on the case before you arrived, and I came across this. It played an extremely prominent part in tonight's story. Well, what is it, Dr. Watson? It looks like a dried leaf of some kind. In its younger days, Mr. Bell, it was a sprightly sprig of parsley. <laughs> oh, Dr. Watson, I know you have the habit of collecting odd mementos from your cases, but a sprig of parsley... And yet, my boy, this withered piece of greenery enables Sherlock Holmes to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. The strange death of Mrs. Abernethy. Well, this I've got to hear. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the mystery of the withered parsley and the strange death of Mrs. Abernethy? Well, Mr. Bell, at the time I'm talking about, this parsley, just like myself, was a great deal younger. Oh. <laughs> but to, to get on with my story, Holmes had just concluded his amazing investigation in the affair of the Reading Bicycle Pump murder and we decided to stay for a few days in the nearby beautiful village of Pangbourne. The weather was surprisingly generous for an English summer, and on our second day, Holmes and I had gone for a stroll along the towpath of the River Thames. Holmes was in an extremely morose mood that day, I remember, as we walked back towards our hotel. Ah, oh, the country's beautiful here, Holmes. Yes, I suppose it is. Oh, come, come. Look at the red and grey roofs of the cottages. And the farms peeping out through the trees over there. So peaceful and, and soothing. I'm afraid it has the reverse effect on me, Watson. That's the curse of having a mind like mine. Oh, how do you mean, Holmes? I observe everything with reference to my own special subject. You look at those scattered houses and I'm impressed by their peace and beauty. I look at them and think how easily crime may be committed there. Good Lord, who'd associate crime with a spot like that? It's my opinion, Watson, based on experience, that the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling countryside. What a morbid thought. The reason is obvious. The pressure of public opinion can do in the city what the law cannot accomplish. There's no lane so dark that the scream of a tortured child or the thud of a drunkard's blow does not obtain sympathy and help from some neighbor. But look at these lonely houses. Think of the deeds of hellish cruelty, the hidden wickedness, which may go on year in, year out in such places and no one the wiser. Oh, upon my soul, Holmes, you're in a particularly depressing mood. Hello, hello, hello. Look at this fellow running towards us. Must be crazy. Imagine galloping along a towpath on a hot day like this. And from his expression, I think we may reasonably assume that he's not doing it for the exercise. Excuse me, Excuse me but if, is uh, one of you gentlemen Dr. Watson? Yes, sir, I am. And this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, how do you do, sir? Holmes. How do you do? Uh, my name is Gareth Abernethy. I heard that you were staying in the village. I went to your hotel and uh, they told me that you'd uh, gone for a walk in this direction. I presume you need a doctor's help. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Dr. Watson, I know you're on a holiday, oh, but... Oh, well, wanna... naturally, I'm at your service, sir. What, what is wrong? No, perhaps we could start walking back to the inn. Uh, my horse and trap are there, and uh, I'll tell you about it as we go. My, uh, my mother's just had a bad heart attack. Yeah, uh, we live at Homeby Grange, a few miles out of the village. I'd, uh, I'd like to drive you out there at once, but Doctor. But surely if you live here, you must have a, a family doctor. Well, he's in London for a few days. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, tell me, Mr. Abernethy, uh, what were the symptoms of your, your mother's heart attack? Well, she, she said she was taking her usual nap before lunch. She started to go to sleep and, uh, and suddenly woke up crying that she was, she was going to die. Said her heart seemed to stop beating entirely for a few moments. Well, has she had these attacks before? Well, I can't tell you much about it. The family says that for her age, she's been in very good health. Uh, I've been abroad for a few years. In China, I observe, Mr. Abernethy. Yes. Yes, I went out there as a war correspondent covering the Boxer Rebellion. But uh, uh, how did you know? The fish that you have tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scale a delicate pink is quite peculiar to that country. Oh, that's amazing, Mr. Holmes. Oh, it's not so amazing as all that. It's just a certain facility for observation, sir. For instance, from what you've told me of, of your mother's symptoms, I should say that her lips are bluish, 
that she runs out of breath for walking upstairs, and the veins in her cheeks are unusually pronounced. <laughs> I begin to think I've met a pair of magicians. Oh, why? Uh, but you're right, Doctor. <laughs> I see I put you on your metal, Watson. How did you deduce that? Elementary, my dear Holmes, the symptoms that Mr. Abernethy uh, described were typical of mitral constriction. I shall be delighted to examine your mother and do whatever I can for her. I'm very grateful, Doctor. You're in good hands, Mr. Abernethy. Well, Watson, I shall see you later, no doubt. This is one case in which I'm sure you need no help from me. Dr. Watson, I'm not much of a one for doctors. Stick out your tongue and give me a guinea. That's what most of them say. <clears throat> well, what's your verdict? Well, that there's nothing seriously wrong, Mrs. Abernethy. Just take these drops I'm giving you before each meal and you'll be well in no time. Uh, Lizzie. Yes, ma'am? You heard what the doctor said. Now try and stop your wool gathering long enough to see that I get those drops. Yes, sir. I won't forget. Ah, you'd forget your own name if the butcher's boy was to ring the bell, though, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. I mean, no one. You can leave the room, Lizzie. Yes, sir. Oh, I think you should rest for a while, Mrs. Abernethy. Plenty of time for rest at my age, Doctor. Anyway, I want to talk to you privately. That's why I sent Lizzie out of the room. I want you to bring your friend Sherlock Holmes here to lunch tomorrow. Sherlock Holmes? But how did you know that... That uh... he was in the village? Uh, there's nothing new in the village or anywhere else going on here that I don't know about, Doctor. Now, will you bring him? I've got something very important to discuss with oh, him. Really, ma'am, I don't think of the oh. state of your heart that you... Oh, what was that filthy oh. medicine you gave me? Oh. It's made me sleepy. Well, that was its purpose, madam. Uh, my family think I'm going to die. They're waiting for it. Hoping for it. Oh, rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. You're not going to die, madam. We'll fool them, doctor, won't we? We'll fool them. Oh, who is Now, it? now, now, Mrs. Abernethy. I'll go to the door. Oh, doctor... I came to see how Granny was getting along. I'm Rose Abernathy. Oh, I'm Dr. Watson. How do you do, my dear? Oh, who is it, Doctor? It's me, Granny. I came to see how you are. Take the doctor downstairs, Rose. Give him some tea and introduce him to the rest of the family. He's got bad news for them. I'm going to live. <laughs> Gareth, will you introduce Dr. Watson, please? Of course, my dear Rose. And I appreciate your motive in giving me the privilege. A, a, a shy, retiring girl like yourself would hardly dare make such a descriptive introduction as I will. Uncle Gareth, you've been drinking again. Well, since I was the only member of this heartless Abernethy clan that had the initiative to go and get a doctor, I think I was entitled to a brandy or two. Oh, oh c come on, Watson. Uh, come and meet my noble brothers. They're here in the library, waiting like hopeful vultures for bad news about our dear mother's health. Oh, really, sir, I think perhaps some other time. Oh, no, 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 no. M might as well get it over with. I'm sorry, Dr. Watson. I didn't know Uncle had been drinking. Oh, that's quite all right, my dear child. Uh, uh, Dr. Watson, uh, let me introduce my brother, Ernest. How do you do? How are you, Dr. Watson? Uh, since the success of Oscar Wilde's recent comedy of manners, Ernest has been unbearable. I, I think he took its title too literally. I suppose you're referring to the importance of being Ernest. No, As you say, Doctor, my brother is a brilliant wit, and Brandy sharpens his perceptions even more. He's been known to launch a whole string of leaden epigrams in the course of one evening. Yes, and he's been known to do an honest day's work in his life, which is more than you can say, my dear Ernest. Darius, I'm sure Dr. Watson has no desire to listen to our dreary wrangling. Why not introduce him to John? I'm going to. Uh, Watson, uh, this is my other brother, John Abernethy. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Doctor? John is the respectable member of the family. He manages the estates here, and at least has the unique distinction of having worked for the money he gets from Mother. You shouldn't talk like this in front of a stranger, Gareth. Bad form, you know. Yes, Uncle Gareth. Dr. Watson's come here to tell us about Granny. Oh, then let's hear the verdict. 
It means much more to us than you could possibly imagine, I can assure you. Well, I examined Mrs. Abernethy very thoroughly. Considering her age, I'm glad to say that her condition is quite good. I've prescribed genitalis for her, and she should pull through very nicely. In fact, uh, I see no reason why she shouldn't live to be a hundred. Oh, Uncle Ernest, that was one of our nicest wine glasses. <laughs> look at us, Watson. You give us the best possible news, and look at our faces. Don't you realize that this whole family is waiting for one thing? My mother's death? I tell you, Holmes, it was perfectly nauseating. I must say they sound like a peculiarly unattractive family. Well, except the granddaughter Rose, she's a sweet little thing. But the others are a bunch of good-for-nothings. Undoubtedly. And yet my reaction to what you've told me is one of intense curiosity. As I remarked earlier today, the quiet countryside beneath its external beauty cloaks some of the vilest happenings. Well, I admit the atmosphere in that household is vile, all right. And think of the potential tragedy smoldering there. A wealthy matriarch who controls the purse strings. Four relations living there and praying for one thing, her death. No, Watson. With such a setting, my curiosity is overpowering. Then you will call on her? If you think she's in good enough condition to see me. Attempts may have already been made on her well, life. Normally, I'd suggest postponing it for a day or two, but if you think that she's in danger, Quite. I feel... Watson, tomorrow we shall call upon the lady and see what can be done to help her. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Abernethy? Before we go into lunch, I should like to tell you why I asked you to come here today. And I want my family to know, too. Children, I want your attention. Oh, Mother, not another lecture, surely. No, Ernest, not a lecture. Merely a statement of fact. I have asked Mr. Sherlock Holmes here today because he is a detective. <laughs> a detective? What's the matter, Mother? Has someone pinched the family silver? Gareth, be quiet. Now, 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 please don't excite yourself, madam. Remember that heart of yours. Yes, Granny, do be careful. Oh, stop fussing over me, Rose, and sit down. Gareth, you mentioned the family silver. How did you know that's what I was going to speak about? Oh, Mother, I was only joking. Were you? Strange joke. Mr. Holmes, I discovered a few days ago that the Abernethy silver has been stolen piece by piece and replaced by imitation. How do you know, Mrs. Abernethy? I recently had occasion to have some of our silver knives repaired. The blades were loose in the handles. The London jeweler to whom I sent them reported that they were not the family silver, but plated imitations. I had him come down here and examine the rest of the set. They're frauds. I want you to find out who's responsible. I know it's one of these four children. That's oh, ridiculous, Mother. Why suggest that one of us is responsible? Because I know your children too well. Personally, I think it's what you deserve, Mother. How dare you? I'm not dependent on you, Mother, but the others are. You've kept them dangling too long. Look at you, Rose. You're still young. Are you going to stay here another 20 years waiting for your grandmother to die? Get it! Leave her home! Now, now, please, Mrs. Abernethy. Lunch oh. is served, ma'am. Oh, Go away! I love you! Quick, Watson! She's having Doctor. another attack! Out of the room, everybody, please! Oh, Doctor Hill! No, 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 don't worry, Mrs. Abernethy. You're going to be quite all right. Uh. Are you feeling better, Mrs. Abernethy? Yes, Mr. Holmes, I am. That digitalis soon pulled you round, didn't it? You must remember not to take another dose until this evening. In the meanwhile, I think you'd better go and lie down. No, Doctor. I want to go into lunch. And afterwards, I have something else to tell you, Mr. Holmes. Something I don't intend the family to hear. And it's much more significant than stealing silver. Mrs. Abernethy, I think if you were to tell me your real problem now, simply and directly, a great deal of time and patience might be saved. After lunch, Mr. Holmes. Doctor! Give me your arm. Excellent lunch, I must say. Hmm. And the conversation has had all the sparkle and gaiety of a funeral oration. Well, since you've entirely monopolized the conversation, Gareth, that's not very surprising. Well, stop stop the wrangling, you to. two. Got guests. Bad form, you know. Uh, Mr. Holmes, did you care for some more coffee? Thank you, Mrs. Abernethy. I'd like another cup. 
Granny, what's wrong? Your hand's shaking so. Uh, doctor! Doctor! Granny! Doctor, quick, Dr. Watson. Mrs. Abernathy. Ah! Don't be with Mother. Holmes. Holmes. Be good, careful. She's dead. No! Then I must assume a different mission than the one I came here to perform. I suggest that you all leave this room and that one of you sends a servant for the police. Murder has just been committed before our eyes. Murder? But Holmes, she died of a heart attack. When death is so intensely desired by four persons present? No, Watson. I'm afraid I can't assume a verdict of natural death. In proof, I suggest you notice the depth to which that parsley has sunk in the butter. I repeat, send for the police. Oh, no. Well, Dr. Watson, I begin to see what you mean about that withered sprig of parsley. But I still don't understand what it had to do with the death of the old lady. Well, more did I, Mr. Bell, at the time, but Sherlock Holmes soon explained it to me. As soon as the family had left the dining room and the police had been sent for, Holmes and I stood together in that room of death, examining the dining room table. Yes, Watson. I'm certain that she was poisoned before our eyes. But how, Holmes? You'll admit that in her condition a double dose of digitalis would have been fatal? Possibly, yes, but she didn't have an overdose. I gave her some before we came into lunch and told her not to take her usual dose at the table. And she didn't take it. Not consciously, Watson, but I'm convinced that she received another dose in her food. How? She didn't eat the roast lamb that the rest of us had. She simply had two lightly boiled eggs. She cracked them open herself. They couldn't have been poisoned. But she put butter in her eggs. Large quantities of butter. We all ate butter from the same dish, Holmes. True. But once again, I ask you to observe the significant fact. The depth to which the parsley has sunk in the butter. But the parsley hasn't sunk perceptibly at all. That, my dear Watson, is the significant fact. Oh, beg your pardon, sir. Lizzie said as though you thought something was wrong with the lunch. I'm the cook. Something was very wrong with the lunch, my good woman. Oh, I'm sorry. And I hear as our Mrs. Abernethy has been took with another of our spells. Yes, she has. Tell me, was this table laid for lunch at one o'clock? Yes, sir, it was. But you didn't come in till half an hour later. While Mrs. Abernethy's attack delayed us in the drawing room, did anyone come through the kitchen into this room? No, sir. Lizzie and me would have seen them if they had. And when you set the table, you placed this butter here? Yes, sir. As you see, it's garnished with parsley. Did you do that? No, sir, I didn't. That's funny. Who could have put that on there? Uh, Joe Holmes, uh, you're right. But the roast of lamb was, was garnished with parsley, wasn't it? Yes, sir, it was. Splendid. I'm much obliged to you. I hope the mistress finds better soon, sir. Watson, I'm going to take that butter to the village, chemist shop, and have it analyzed. While I'm doing that, I want you to conduct an experiment of your own. What do you want me to do? Obtain a fresh quantity of butter from the kitchen. Place a sprig of parsley on top of it and see how far in half an hour it sinks in. Ridiculous way of spending my time, I must say. Nevertheless, Watson, I think the experiment may give us the vital clue to the murder. Well, Holmes, and what did you find out at the chemist? It was as I suspected, Watson. The butter was thoroughly impregnated with digitalis. And yet we all ate some of it. True. It would not produce any effect on a normally healthy person. In the case of Mrs. Abernethy, however, two doses in quick succession were fatal. Great Scott. What was the result of your experiment, old chap? Well, in half an hour on a blazing hot day like this, parsley sinks quite noticeably into the butter. Therefore, it was placed there shortly before we came in late to lunch, not when the table was set. But what was the motive? The butter had been shaped by a mold. It was patterned on the top. The murderer used a hypodermic needle to inject the digitalis. And he had to hide the holes made by the needle. So he took the parsley from the roast and placed it on the butter. Who? Who had the opportunity? That's what we have to find out. Have the police arrived? Yes, there's a Sergeant Jenkins in charge. He's out there in the kitchen questioning the servants. Then let's join forces. A murder is in this house, Watson. Between us, we've got to catch him. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I've questioned everybody. The cook, Martha, says nobody came in through the kitchen when lunch was waiting on the table. And yet we know somebody did, Sergeant. Well, perhaps they came through the window. I checked that too, sir. The gardener was working in the rhododendron bed outside. He said no one went in that way. And the only other entrance to the dining room was the door leading into the library. Oh, I checked on that one too, Mr. Holmes. Mr. John Abernethy and his brother Ernest were playing a game of chess there. 
They swore that no one went through that door. Well, it looks as if no one could have tampered with the butter. Whereas we know they did. Sergeant Jenkins, you've been very thorough in your examinations. But one of these witnesses is lying. We must talk to them again. Martha, when you said no one came through your kitchen and went into the dining room, you meant no member of the family, didn't you? That's right, sir. If it had been one of the other domestics, uh, Lizzie, for example, you wouldn't have noticed it? No, you mentioned it, sir. Lizzie did go in just before they came into lunch. Lizzie did, but... Did Quite, it... Watson. Sergeant, please ask Mr. Ernest Abernethy to step in here for a moment. Yes, Mr. Holmes, Lizzie did go through the library door, but I can't see that fact as of much importance. Uh, possibly you can't. And yet I assure you my question was not an idle one. Was Lizzie uh, carrying anything, do you recall? I really didn't notice. I'm afraid I find the problems of chess, uh, even with Brother John as an opponent, more interesting than the perambulations of the worthy Lizzie. Lizzie. Yes, sir? You did go into the room just before lunch? Yes, sir. I remember that I forgot to put the claret out. So would be room temperature. Mr. Ernest is most particular about that. Thank you, Lizzie. You may go. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, do you think she did it? Surely there's no doubt of it in your mind now, is there? Well, there is in mine, Mr. Holmes, and no mistake. And yet the case is solved, Sergeant. Let's go into the drawing room and I'll introduce you to our murderer. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you can all see now how the murder was committed. But by Lizzie? But that doesn't seem possible, Mr. Holmes. What motive would she have? Oh, I could understand her motive. Mother's been an absolute tyrant with her. I find it hard to believe that with her adult-pated mentality, she'd have the imagination to think of such a plot. Oh, no, Gareth. The man responsible for this murder is you. Uncle Gareth! Oh, this is ridiculous. I did not say the murderer. I said the man responsible. But Holmes, what on earth are you driving at? Gareth, by his example in finding a job and going abroad, caused one of his other relatives to become disgusted with the life of a parasite. That person decided to go beyond such petty devices as stealing silver and to turn to murder. An Abernethy? Commit murder? I say, really, a remarkably I mean, brilliant all, observation. Which one is John? it, Holmes? Surely that's obvious. Two witnesses, the cook and Ernest, at first swore no one had entered the dining room. Then, when I asked a question based on one of the elementary flaws of direct evidence, each admitted that Lizzie had entered. Lizzie herself admitted it, Mr. Holmes. Very true. She told us in detail how she had entered the dining room once. But the witnesses had her entering twice. The cook saw her come through the kitchen door, and you, Ernest, admitted that she had passed you through the library door. Someone else had realized that same flaw of evidence, that no employer really notices the actions of a servant. Someone else had entered that room in the maid's uniform. And who is the only suspect who could have done that? I your Rose Abernethy. Oh, the shy and retiring Rose? Yes, I killed Granny. When Dr. Watson said that Grandmother might live another 20 years, I saw that I'd never get away from here. Well, you're getting away from here now, miss. I'm taking you over to the station. I don't care. I'd be an old maid. That's and I warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence I'm against glad you. I'm I killed you. What a shocking case. I'm glad we're headed back to our hotel and never have to see that Abernethy family again. We'll have to make a brief appearance at the trial of the girl, I'm afraid. I still find it hard to believe that quiet, shy little thing was capable of conceiving such a devilish murder. Solitude, unhappiness, and the companionship of an evil, maladjusted family and a tyrannical grandmother breed dark fancies, Watson. She dressed up in a maid's uniform, convinced that no one would give her a second glance, and then, having poisoned the butter, returned changed her dress and sat down at the luncheon table. Precisely. Well, Watson, this has been an unsavory case, but it points a moral. A moral that I hope you, as my self-appointed biographer, will profit well, by. And what moral is that? The extreme importance of observing details. Miss Abernetti would not now be on her way to a prison cell if I hadn't noticed one vital clue. The depth to which the parsley had sunk in the butter. <laughs> Just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us something about next week's story. Now, Dr. Watson, 
What about next week? Well, next week I think I'll tell you about the singular... Pardon me, it was the singular affair of the Coptic Compass. The Coptic Compass? Sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. Sherlock Holmes found it so, Mr. Bell. The adventure started one afternoon when Holmes and I, returning to our Baker Street rooms, found, lying in the middle of our floor, an unclothed corpse. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Six Napoleons. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the Coptic Compass. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.